So we're Nim Tim Architects. I'm Nim, this is Tim. We started about 10 years ago and we're now a practice of 10 plus the dog. Our work is focused on reflecting the needs, ambitions and values of the people that we use the buildings. My name is Liza Feel. Um, representing Muff Architecture Art, a practice who only works in the public realm and by that it includes buildings, open spaces, parks and even museums. So OMMX was founded in 2010 as a space for continued learning. We're an office of nine people. Um, we hope that we're more than the sum of our parts, but we are definitely kind of reliant on each individual being able to be free to express their opinions, to create. I'm Katrina Stewart, and this is Hugh McEwen. Um, and together we run a practice called Office S&M Architects. We work on lots of different projects, uh, different scales, uh, with a 50-50 split of uh, working with public clients on one side on high streets and community spaces and markets and on the other side we work with private clients on houses, uh, workspaces and nurseries. I think architectural drawings changed a lot, especially from like sort of John own time where it was about the, the drawing and the piece of architecture. As, as kind of the object and now it's become well actually the object needs to be inhabited and ha and we need to show people that, that that they can see themselves in it so that everybody has a voice in what we're producing and so that's why I think some of our best kind of drawings has been where we show multiple voices. Yeah and the figure becomes really crucial there because then if, if you took the figure out of these drawings then they wouldn't really make that much sense. But as soon as you add in the figure and the scale... And the activity. And the activity, then it, it makes the concept make sense. We're engaging really broadly our, on our projects with a, with a wide variety of people. And so it's sort of how do you make, how do you kind of make some of these quite un, unusual ways of representing things through plans or sections into something that's kind of very approachable. Uh, and that you can you can kind of have a discussion around. You know, we we take a very human centric approach in terms of how we design, and so it's really thinking about how those how people are going to experience that space. It's not thinking of it as a kind of a mechanistic thing or or, or a kind of financial thing. So we don't always draw lots of people in our drawings, but our drawings and our designs are peopled because we start with with the body and making room for multiple bodies in public space. Use changes meaning of a place. And so imagining the, um, the end users, not the person who's necessarily written the brief, not the project manager who's checking where you are in terms of the program, but those who will encounter this work when you're no longer around to tell them how they should use it. And, and what we've discovered is the more we think about those bodies, those users, very early on in the design stage, it brings um, a precision and an accuracy which allows both um, the uses imagined, but also other appropriations. Leaving things open for the kind of unexpected. What, I mean, one of the things that um, we really like to do is, is to photograph uh, buildings um, once they're completed with with people in them that always kind of reveals things that we didn't expect or didn't in some way kind of envisage which is always really nice I remember um, when we finished a project uh, called Salmon House it's a kind of pink house on a corner a few months later after it was completed people came back and and were doing like fashion shoots in front of it or um, influencers were having like you know photo shoots in front of it and that was just really lovely that suddenly this private home had become something that was very public and that the kind of local community I suppose had um, embraced it. We need to show multiple voices being represented in what we're doing. A lot of our clients 
that there are lots of different types of users. For example, they might be rabbits, they might be children, they might be elderly. Some of them might not have English as a first language, for example, or they may not be born in this country. Um, so we really want to engage those people so that they can have a meaningful impact in what we're producing. Public tenders have largely gone down the route of asking around issues of inclusion and issues of sustainability and kind of planetary and global sort of justice in that way. Architects have inevitably, as a profession, kind of shifted their language, their rhetoric, also their drawn rhetoric in that direction. The difficulties of representing kind of disadvantaged or excluded groups are essentially, it can easily lead to further exploitation. I mean, you see it across society where there's like a university ad advertising the university with the only black female in their campus at the front smiling. You know, these sorts of things. And you get this also in architectural drawing, sadly. How do we try and evolve our drawings to respond to that? We're learning. As I said before, we're still learning and it's a process of learning. Um, but I think our hope is to remain sincere um, and for it not to become just another tool to win work, get rich, sustain the status quo with the same people winning the same work. A drawing for Birmingham Museum is an art gallery, um, specifically revisioning uh, an existing museum called Think Tank imagining its transformation. It has a huge collection, everything made in Birmingham. And it, it was a sort of question about how to make a different sort of relationship to these objects and to make a relationship to the city. Everyone here were people who were visitors to the museum. They were people we met off-site in Birmingham, people we met cooking, uh, the, what would it, would, it, would it mean to have an iftar in the museum? And so if you look closely, I think, I think there is no repetition. It is heavily peopled, but the people aren't drawn to fill the space. Rather, the people are representing the many conversations that built up this multi-layered idea. And it's different types of representations. So for the Beckon Tree project, one of the things that stuck with everyone when we presented was actually a video of our daughter trying to cycle down the pavement and there were these bins and there were cars but just having that visual of seeing a child unable to kind of use the space as it was intended was actually incredibly powerful. This is a drawing actually it doesn't have a figure as in there's not a human person standing there but it, it came back to that question about where is the figure in, in representation and for us we saw the complexity of lots of different human relationships within actually setting out this elevation of facade. So the elevation itself speaks about the history of, of fire safety, of security, uh, for example the ventilation of a window, security of potentially different people in there, security of women. So we saw people Everywhere when we were composing this facade, it wasn't a simple case of just composing a facade, you're actually composing many figures. We as an office kind of encourage people, individuals, to explore their own lived experience and their own kind of desires and ways of drawing and we can kind of nurture and foster that as best we can. I hope as an office that we will continue to evolve and be slightly mercurial when it comes to the way that we draw figures, the way we draw people. And I hope that the people that we are drawing are also ourselves within the images or the communities that we come from. Our projects have over the, over the years in the photos gotten more and more kind of messy. We've taken, we've deliberately spent less time tidying up. It just feels a lot more kind of relatable when it's, you know, how spaces normally are. Again, it's about communication. What's this space actually going to be like to live in? And it's not going to be perfect all the time. So including figures, but also including all the things that come along with figures like mess and, you know, cups and plates. Dog bed. And, 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 and dogs yeah. and, yeah. So I think uh, 
that's an interesting way of looking at drawings in the future. I think the hope for the future would be that it continues on that that sort of path of kind of aiming towards a certain honesty and, and inclusiveness. And it, it'll, it'll be interesting how kind of new technologies kind of feed into that, you know. Uh, it's very interesting kind of seeing image generation through AI and, you know, virtual reality being ways that you can create something that's much more immersive and involving. Um, but it's also considering what are the kind of limitations of those things. But I think, I think ultimately for us it's continuing that aspiration of making things approachable and making you know, architecture very involving um, and, and having something that you know, is an experience as you're going through the process of design, but also an experience once, once it's finished. And so in going back to that idea of what was being represented in drawings as statements of intent, uh, Muff recognises that we will never be fully representative of the places we work. And so we always seek partnerships, seek other bodies of knowledge, find ways that people are paid for their time and ensure that that early involvement is played out through to the final design. I think it's not about doing a drawing and then filling it with people that might um, be seen to be representing a place, but actually it is in the technical drawings, in the planning drawings, in the specification, that those early conversations are um, embedded and the drawing is a place to do that. Mm -hmm.